Institute for Faith and Freedom at Grove City College presents Liberty Mail with the Student Fellows of Faith and Freedom. Hello and welcome to Liberty Mail. My name is Grace Riley and we are recording here in the underground studio at Grove City College and I have the pleasure of being joined by a special guest, Dr. William Imboden, who is a professor and director of the Hamilton Center for Classical and Civic Education at the University of Florida. He previously served as executive director and William Powers Jr. Chair at the William P. Clements Jr. Center for National Security at the University of Texas at Austin. He also also served as the Senior Director for Strategic Planning on the National Security Council at the White House and at the Department of State as a member of the Policy Planning Staff and a Special Advisor in the Office of International Religious Freedom. And also I want to mention is the author of The Peacemaker, Ronald Reagan, The Cold War, and The World on the Brink. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you, Grace. It's great to be with you. Yeah, it's a pleasure, and we're recording this in anticipation for the 16th annual Ronald Reagan Lecture, which will take place tonight here at Grove City College, um, where the topic is Confronting a Dangerous World, Lessons from Ronald Reagan's Foreign Policy. So to begin, I'd love to start with the Ronald Reagan Doctrine and mm -hmm. Peace Through Strength and what he meant by that in his leadership during the Cold War and how that can be applied today with all of the crazy things that we're facing right now. Yeah, it certainly is a very dangerous and challenging world right now. It's a very uh, uh, forbidding geopolitical moment, but I do think some of President Reagan's uh, principles uh, and even policies would be uh, certainly as relevant today as they were in the 1980s when he was successfully uh, winning the Cold War on, on, in, on peaceful terms. And that the victory and the peace part are the two most, uh, most significant ones. So, um, you know, a couple uh, general thoughts that come to mind there. Uh, peace through strength uh, really is the mantra associated with him, and rightfully so. He, 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 uh, he often intoned that. But it wasn't just a slogan for him. Uh, it, embedded within that was a pretty sophisticated doctrine predicated on um, integrating force and diplomacy. Uh, so you know, President Reagan is well remembered for his military buildup and modernization, restoring funding to the Pentagon, developing a new generation of, uh, of weapon systems. But he did that not because he wanted to start a war, but because he wanted to stop a war. He wanted to deter a war. But he knew that weakness can be provocative and that the best way to restore or preserve peace in the world and certainly defend the United States is through strength. Uh, and so there was a diplomatic purpose to his, his military buildup, um, which is he wanted it to strengthen America's hand at the negotiating table. Uh, the Soviet Union, you know, Soviet communism was our primary adversary at the time, um, and you certainly posed a very mortal threat to the United States. So President Reagan's goal was to send a message to the Soviets uh, that their aggression would not pay, that they could not get away with it, that if they did try to attack the United States or our allies, uh, that they would be defeated. Uh, but he didn't want to stop there. He wanted to use our strength, our military strength, to induce them to the negotiating table, to kind of to bring the Soviets back and say, all right, well, let's negotiate a peaceful end to this conflict. Uh, and, it, and it worked, and it worked wonderfully. A lot, lot of other strands to his policies I, I could talk about there, but it starts with that basic posture of, of a strong military uh, creates the conditions for strong diplomacy and protects America while avoiding conflict. Yeah, and it seems like that's the perfect lesson that we need to learn right now because mm -hmm. as many are concerned, uh, it seems that we're on the brink of a potential third world war with the state of everything going on in Israel, in Ukraine, with Iran and China being bigger threats. And a lot of people seem to be discouraged about how leaders have handled these things mm -hmm. as of now. Do you have any thoughts on that and how leaders should move to lead through strength instead? And also on the challenge that Israel is facing right now and on the geopolitical challenge that America is facing looking at all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, there's there's a lot there. I'll just give you a, a few thoughts. The first is, in a lot of ways, this does feel like a 1970s moment again. Uh, there there are dissimilarities between then and now, so I don't want to over overstate it. But, but the commonalities of the United States uh, having a, a, a weakened economy and just being a demoralized and divided country, losing faith 
faith in ourselves. Um, our military being hollowed out and stretched thin and underfunded uh, was the case then and is the case now. Uh, you know, a malevolent Iran uh, was the case then when they took our mm -hmm. uh, when they took our uh, hostages. 52 our hostages, our 52 American diplomats and spies uh, hostage, uh, and then a nuclear armed communist superpower on the Eurasian landmass. Right back then, it was the Soviet Union as the was the main menace. Now it's now it's communist China, but also aggression coming from the Kremlin was this concern then and is the is the concern now. Um, as well as multiple wars in the Middle East was the concern then and is the is the concern now. And, and so uh, with all that, it's a good reminder that leadership matters. Um, again, not being too political here, but we had you know a series of presidents in the 1970s, Democrats and Republicans, who were not able to restore the America uh, America's belief in itself uh, and restore our strength on the global stage. Um, and you know, similarly, it's been a little little while since we've had, I think, uh, similarly inspiring le leadership. Um, and yet, I think the fact that Reagan was able to overcome those challenges, was able to restore the country's strength and belief in itself. Um, and that's one of the component I should bring up is Reagan believed that America's strength wasn't just economic or military; it was our values. Uh, and he was deeply committed to our our democratic freedoms, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of conscience. Uh, and he thought, and he knew that those were. Inspired Inspiring to the rest of the world, and he really, he really believed in those. And uh, drawing on that strength of our values, uh, in turn, I think gave him the, uh, the the credibility and the posture he needed to confront, you know, the, the terrible threats to our, our country that we faced then. Uh, so I would, I would similarly hope for uh, our our leaders today to recover that sense of American exceptionalism and belief in our values. And from that, all the other material strength can be improved as well. Yeah, I think that that's really, really true, and that's my hope as well. And as someone who wasn't alive during the Cold War, mm -hmm. I, I do sense the tension. Even not experiencing it then, I can tell now, oh, this feels not good, not knowing yeah. what's going to happen next. Um, and especially as the nation surrounding Israel, I mean, most of them are f more friendly with Israel now, obviously, mm. than they were back during 1973, the Yom yeah. Kippur War. Yeah. But even so, even with that, can you outline some of the similarities that Israel's facing from that war as this attack started on October 7th, the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War? What are some of the similarities that they're facing um, now based on how that went years ago. Yeah, and again, uh, just as we were talking about some similarities of America's challenges are some similarities that Israel is, is facing as well. Differences too, you know, and mm -hmm. if we had a few hours, we could go into those. But the, the similarities, I think, are the ones that are more, more compelling. Uh, then as now, Israel was surrounded on multiple sides with, uh, with foes committed to its destruction. That, that's the big one, right? Um, back then, it was primarily Egypt and Syria and Jordan were very hostile to it, as well as the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, you know, a terrorist organization uh, that was committed to Israel's destruction. Um, and now uh, it's it's Hamas to the south. Uh, it is uh, it is some of the Palestinian terrorist groups operating in the West Bank, uh, and then is Hezbollah to the north, all uh, supported and sponsored by Iran, right? So that's that's the first big fundamental one. Uh, and the second one is then is now um, Israel, uh, the Israeli people are very committed to fighting for their own defense, but they rely on the United States for weapons supplies, technology, intelligence support. And they're very open about that. Uh, and the United States played a critical role in 1973 in, in the resupply operation, uh, which enabled Israel to survive. We weren't sending American troops there, but we were sending our weapons and other support. And similarly now, uh, you know, we are doing, as, as a country, doing all that we can to support Israel. Um, so, yeah, uh, so there, there certainly are some compelling similarities. Yeah, absolutely, which is very interesting in analyzing this. And I just want to end on the point that you made about values and how that was such a crucial part of Reagan's leadership and American leadership and the idea that he was fighting against ideas in a sense and um, upholding American values. I wonder if you can touch more on that um, and the importance of those values, because here at the Institute for Faith and Freedom, we obviously hold those very, very true um, and I guess on top of that, how can we promote the values of, in, of faith and freedom and American exceptionalism 
to citizens and for myself, for my peers. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and I'll I'll start with that last part. There is that's why I'm a big proponent of studying and you know teaching our country's history because I do think there are so many inspiring episodes in our country's history, and our very founding itself is inspiring. Um, and you know, too much of and I speak now as a college professor. Too much of our current generation of students is just unaware of uh, you know America's you know really exceptional and inspiring history and our founding principles. Um, uh, so I, I would certainly start with the importance of studying history. Uh, but to the question about our values and what they mean for our, our foreign policy, uh, yeah, this was one of President Reagan's great insights. Uh, and I'll elaborate a little more on this in my remarks tonight. But he saw the Cold War as fundamentally a battle of ideas. It wasn't just between two powerful rival nation states. Most other presidents had conceived it that way. President Reagan said, no, this is a battle of ideas between Soviet communism uh, and its, its state-mandated main, mandated atheism, um, its hostility to need personal freedom, its hostility to free markets, and its commitment to aggression uh, and expansion around the world. And that was the idea that he wanted to defeat. But he knew that it's not enough just to criticize a bad idea. You need to show a better idea as the alternative. Uh, and so that's why he believed in uh, in protecting American freedoms at home, but also promoting um, religious freedom, political freedom, economic freedom internationally. And he knew that these, these American ideals were not just only American ideals. He thought that they were human ideals, and he thought that they should be uh, inspiring to others around the world and that they were ones that others aspired to around the world as well. And he was right in that, and that's why we saw the tremendous expansion of, of free markets and free societies in the 1980s on almost every continent, um, inspired at least in part by his by his leadership there. And that's ultimately what uh, what brought the Soviet Union down. Uh, sure, the American military buildup and economic pressure and its own internal rot played other things, but it's that so many of the the Soviet people didn't believe in the idea of communism. And frankly, a lot of the Soviet leaders also lost faith in the idea of communism. They, they knew that it was, you know, ideologically and morally bankrupt, uh, that it had hollowed out and really ruined their society. Uh, and there were very few of them who, you know, continued to believe in it up until the end. And that's ultimately why, why it was defeated. And so now we face some similar foes, you know, uh, Ch Chinese communism as an idea. Um, <clears throat> Uh, certainly, uh, Islamic jihadism and, and militancy is exemplified by Hamas, and then Iran in, in some different ways as well. That's a that's a very pernicious idea. Uh, I think some of the ideas around Putin's authoritarianism are also really, uh, really, really toxic, and I think need to be argued against. And so, recapturing that sense of we are once again in a battle of ideas uh, for for the good of the free world, uh, I think is the beginning of strategic wisdom, and certainly would be consistent with the Reagan legacy. Very well said. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join me. I would encourage everyone to check out your book, The Peacemaker, and to go watch the lecture. It should be up on our page if you weren't able to attend it in person. But thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you, Grace, and best wishes to you and uh, all your wonderful fellow students here at Grove City. Thanks so much. Thanks. For more information on the Institute for Faith and Freedom, visit faithandfreedom.com.